on the North Carolina constitutional amendment front for the midterm elections, on that ballot, we're going to see an opportunity for voters to allow the legislature to join with the Supreme Court and the governor to create a commission That's right. to find our state judges. Dan Bishop is here, the senator from Mecklenburg County, led the select committee on... Judicial reform. I want to make sure I got that right. Thank you, sir, for being on. Time to pick your brain just Thank a you, moment. Glad to be with you. Tell me about this proposal at the very high level. The governor picks the judges. This would say he takes a recommendation. Right. So it only applies to judicial vacancies. So it, it, voters will still elect judges, including the ones who were picked by this process. But now, as you said, the governor picks them. Uh, this is a step into what we refer to as merit selection. So. Uh, the idea is to bring some sunlight into the process, start with a, with a commission to rate the credentials of the, of the nominees or, or candidates for the judgeship, and then uh, to, uh, to have an, an explicit, exclusive or explicit focus on their merit to begin the process, and then have a funnel, if you will. So it goes from the Merit Selection Commission to the General Assembly, they narrow it, and then the governor picks. So the, the commission comes up with a list of names, hands it to senators and representatives such as yourself, You'll pick two. That's right. Approve those. They'll go to the governor's desk. That's correct. Ten days later, if he or she is the governor, hasn't selected the judge, the legislature can select the judge on the governor's behalf. That's right. Uh, you call that merit. Um, I think the governor probably has a different opinion on that. Quite a few governors have a different opinion on that. But why do you feel it's needed? Why is it merit? Why, why is it what the judges or the governors have been doing not based on merit? Well. The, the, the real issue there is that it's, it brings sunlight into a process that's previously been a backroom process. So the governor, you know, there's really no system in the country. And when we studied uh, judicial reform issues over a period of many months in committee, nobody recommended, frankly, that one person pick judges. Think about in the Kavanaugh process we just had in the United States Supreme Court. What do you think folks would have thought if, if the, to say that federal judges uh, filling a vacancy would be picked by the president alone? Uh, that's what we've been doing. So it's a flaw, if you will, and really sort of an un, one undemocratic facet of the Constitution of 1868 uh, that when we went to picking judges by elections, uh, we left this, probably thinking it was unimportant, that the governor would alone fill vacancies. Mm -hmm. And uh, but as it, you know, it turns out to be pretty doggone important. Uh, governors fill about 20 percent of the bench, the entire judiciary over the course of a term. and. Uh, and it's resulted, sometimes it's been abused as a political patronage device. Uh, Governor Perdue, for example, uh, appointed three of her staff uh, to judgeships on her last, not, last day in office. Uh, those sorts of things have happened more than once. And uh, the better approach, we think, is to have an open process in which both bodies, both, both branches of government participate, and it starts with a, with a merit selection process. Well, it's very easy as a Republican to call out Democratic governors, but the Republican governors out there are, are going after this against it because it's the executive power you're taking away. People understand Democratic, Republican, partisan politics, but executive branch versus the legislative branch, that's where this battle is, Senator. Well, I suppose it is, but in, and it points in time uh, people, and maybe this time more than most, uh, people's partisanship sort of is, is front and center and they have a hard time looking at the, the merit of something, the, whether it's a, it, it's a, an, whether it makes a persuasive case for doing it. But I understand uh, governors uh, remember how they had it when they were in office and, and they're fans of executive power. That's not a surprise. Uh, and chief justices of the Supreme Court uh, uh, in the past have, uh, the former chief justices have said they're not in favor of this amendment, but every one of those chief justices <laughs> received a gubernatorial appointment. Uh, the very nature of separation of powers anticipates that there's a balance and to have the judiciary beholden to the executive we think doesn't make much sense. So back to this process because voters this is a big issue this changes the way we do judicial appointments and politics in North Carolina if, if the vacancies the vacancy if voters approve it so a commission is created the Supreme Court just everyone has a say at that commission and and those names get given to the General Assembly. Right. How long of a process do you see from determining the merit of candidates 
to officially giving legislators a list of qualified nominees to you passing it to the sitting governor for consideration and selection? You know, the detail of that is yet to be determined. So one of the things that would occur if voters approve this is to have a process of, of a drafting and passing enabling legislation to, to address all those details. And people's motivations will be in the right place to you know, come forward with those details and to participate fully in that once that's on the table. But I, I would envision a process of 90 days probably to, to, uh, to get a review and uh, to have a legislative committee pass on it and, and meet folks and then pass on names to the governor and him to take a, him or her to take a final decision. You use an inside the belt line term called enabling legislation. You pass the amendment, what right. happens then? Enabling legislation is a bill. Could you give us a kitchen table descriptor of that? I think so. So uh, constitutions uh, are fairly limited in size and fr frankly they get too big even as it is, but you want them to be stating general principles, general concepts. Uh, so if the voters say, yeah, for, for vacancy appointments, we think it would be a better idea to have a merit selection funnel type process that goes through the legislature and then the General Assembly. Once that principle is established, you'll have a pass a bill through the House and the Senate uh, and, and that will uh, and be uh, subject to veto, uh, frankly, that would uh, decide the details. How will the process go in, uh, exactly? What, what, uh, what qualifications might the uh, nonpartisan uh, judicial nominating or, or credentialing commission uh, uh, consider. So like the ABA has has picked integrity and professional competence and judicial temperament. Maybe those would be appropriate here. But those are the kinds of details that are filled in by enabling legislation. Would it be appropriate though, even though this commission would submit a list of names of quote qualified candidates for a judicial vacancy, do you see the House and Senate all the way down to rank and file member now getting involved in creating characters out of these nominees and seeing what we have seen with the Supreme Court where you have protest on individuals. You know, I, I, I certainly, first of all, that was a terrible process. Uh, an important part of our constitutional structure, but this one was nothing to be proud of, obviously. Uh, I see no reason we'd emulate that. Uh, but, and I, but I do think it would be similar. You saw the Judiciary Committee sure. tasked with uh, m the main review process for nominees. I imagine something like that would occur. Do you see that process being open to the public at the General Assembly level? Because, I mean, I've seen legislative leaders, they can do whatever they want and just roll a bill out. Do you see this being more open with hearings and cons or at least uh, days-long looks at different candidates? I do. I don't think it would be a process that's going to take six months or something in the General Assembly as, it, as uh, you see the, the process in Washington going on and on. Uh, but I would uh, imagine that, uh, that, I think it ought to have more structure than maybe many of our committee processes do. Uh, there ought to be some rules probably about how we have communications with nominees and so forth. Uh, but I certainly think uh, input from the public is, is one of the nice features of this. You'll get more of it than you've had uh, where governors are picking vacancy appointments and you gotta know somebody on their staff, you gotta have a way in to the governor's office. Uh, in this case, you got anybody can nominate themselves. They can, you can nominate a, a colleague or a friend and start the process, and then you'll have the commission that will come forward with qualification ratings, and then the General Assembly will proceed after that in a committee process. Well, thank you, Senator Bishop, Mecklenburg County, and, and the Senate Select Committee on Judicial Reform. Long title, thanks for your work on this uh, issue, and thanks for spending time with us. Thank you, Kelly. Amendments Explained is a production of UNCTV in association with the North Carolina Bar Association and the North Carolina Bar Association Foundation.